Good evening. My name is Krista Bowe, and I'm an academic advisor for the TRIO Student Support Services Program and coordinator of the Wolf Talks. This speaker series focuses on unlocking creativity, self-regulation, productivity, and the digital age. It's held in conjunction with our common read book, Bored and Brilliant. Tonight, our presentation is brought to you by the NSU Honors Program. I would now like to introduce honors student, Mathieu Cheap, to introduce our speaker. So good night, everyone. I would like to say that it's my big pleasure that I could share a few words before our actual keynote tonight. I'm Matej Cheep. I'm an international degree-seeking student from the Czech Republic, majoring in music. And my charge for this evening was about to introduce our tonight's keynote. And I was asking him, Petr, tell me one important thing or a few important things I should mention about you, because I know he has done so many important and amazing things. And he told me, you know what, Matej? Don't talk about me, because I'm going to introduce myself. Just share a, share a story and get people excited about the night. So I decided that I'm going to share a small story with you. I would have not been studying here if I would have not read his book. And that's a true fact. I, have, I read this book when I was in my high school, my sophomore year. And even it didn't come all of a sudden, but I could feel that I could become a better person every single day. Thanks to that I could gradually work on myself because I got something from his book. I got some of his ideas and I could realize them and I could find my dream and I could start living my dream. I could start working on my dream and right now I can live my dream every single day. If I would be standing in any university in Czech Republic, I'm pretty sure that around 90% of those students would know who P Peter is because he's a really important character in our country. And I would like to say that it's very amazing and it's a pleasure for us, thanks to Honors Program, that we can have Peter on our campus because his knowledge and his book is very good. So now, I would like to welcome the international best-selling author, the author of the most best-selling book from the Czech Republic called The End of Procrastination. So ladies and gentlemen, Peter Ludwig. Enjoy. <laughs> So, hi and welcome. Tell me, who procrastinates? <laughs> so, yeah. You see that the topic is quite important in 21st century because we live in a world that is made for procrastination. Yeah, we have social media. We are often overwhelmed by emails, by so many priorities, and sometimes we are lost. And not just us, the phenomenon is global, like there is data that procrastination is growing globally. And to fight procrastination is a very important skill in 21st century. So I want to share some key ideas, what uh, science knows about procrastination and how we can decrease it, how we can fight procrastination on a daily basis. So as my friend Matje mentioned, uh, my name is Peter. And uh, I wrote the book, The End of Procrastination. And this book has a very important story because when I wrote it, uh, the expectation was that we will sell about five to 10,000 copies. Now we have 15 translations. And uh, in my country, the book is number one bestseller. We sold more than 100,000 copies in a market that has 10 million people. And uh, the book is probably number one bestseller about procrastination in the world. And it's getting even uh, crazier because the Chinese version is coming soon and with Chinese version we can do a million. So, and we have also Japanese version. I saw some Japanese students, where are you? Yeah, so, konnichiwa. <laughs> and we have a Korean version, so, and you can read the book in many, many languages now. And for me it was, so great pleasure to uh, be in Japan and see my book in a bookstore there. 
And now I want to tell you why I think that uh, it is so successful and what you can learn from my story and how you can deploy some ideas in your daily life. I'm originally from Prague. It's, it's an ancient city in the middle of Europe. But I moved to New York City one year ago because of the book. My publisher, Macmillan, is based in New York, so I made a decision to step out of my comfort zone in my country and move to the US. And that was a difficult choice because uh, I was already successful in my country. My book was number one bestseller. Uh, I was in all TV shows. I had a company with 35 people there. So I, I had a, quite a huge comfort zone there. But for me, it is very important to share my ideas globally because I think that we as a global society, we have some struggles and uh, I want to help more people not to just fight procrastination, but fight, find their life purpose. Because the first chapter is about finding meaning in life and at work. And if you have a meaning, uh, if you have a purpose, then you have much more motivation, intrinsic motivation. You can overcome failure much easier. And basically, to have a purpose is a key to long-term happiness. So that's my key mis mission, to help people globally to have their personal visions and to have a, a purpose in life. So, and now let me describe what is procrastination. Yeah? I love a visual explanation. So we have some tasks to do, then we have time dedicated for those tasks, and how this simple problem is tackled by typical procrastinators. Well, often like this, yeah. And sometimes we feel that under pressure, we perform better, right? No, it's not true. They made a research on that, and it seems that under pressure, we have negative, negative emotions, and our stress hormone cortisol goes up. And the consequence of that is that we have a lower creativity, and our performance actually goes down. So to have a good time management is very important not to just perform better, but it's also very important to experience more positive emotions. Because at the end, if you ever ask what is the key for happiness, it's not to buy a big car or big house. The key to happiness, according to science, is to live every day meaningfully and to the fullest. So it means without procrastination, and basically, there is a lot of research that if you procrastinate a lot, you have high risk of anxieties, high risk of depression. Basically, there is one study showing that more people, the more people procrastinate, basically they have shorter lifespan because they even procrastinate visiting doctors. Or they are procrastinating a healthy lifestyle. They are un unable to exercise more and so on. So to fight procrastination is, is just the key to have better life in general. So tell me, who wants exercise more than he does? Tell me. Who, who wants exercise a little bit more than he does? Who wants eat healthier than he does? And who postpone alarm clock in the morning? Tell me, please. Well, that's a great sign of procrastination. Because postponing alarm clock in the morning, it seems, that more you postpone the alarm clock, the worse you feel, because brain starts to uh, prepare for another sleep, and you, you basically destroy the sleep after 10 minutes. So to wake up for the first alarm clock is, is very important, and I will help you to do that later. <laughs> and I really love quote attributed to Albert Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I love simplicity, I love minimalism, and I'm trying to deploy simplicity in all aspects of my life. If you see my uh, flat in Prague or in New York, it's very minimalist because I have to travel a lot, so what I did was that I bought like 30 pairs of the same black socks, and every day, I, if I grab two socks, they are the same. That's the definition of happiness. <laughs> <coughs> and. So the, the first value that I uh, use in my work and my book is based on that is simplicity. 
I feel that simplicity is very important these days, and really, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. The second very important value that is uh, very important to me, and is very important today, is science-based. Like, everything I do is based in science. It's evidence-based. So if you disagree with something, you can do a research and show me that uh, I was wrong. And that's great, yeah? Because science is the key to understand things. And the last, but not uh, the least, is usefulness. I don't like those self-help books that are full of stories and at the end you don't know what to do. So I want to share three key tools from the book with you today. Tools that you can use starting tomorrow and uh, those tools can help you boost even your productivity, your motivation, improve your time management. Because tools are very important. If you don't have tools, you cannot change yourself. So simplicity, evidence-based approach, and uh, usefulness are three values that uh, combine together. I think that those values are the core of the success of the book and my work in general. So, and now let me ask you, why do we procrastinate so much? What, what are those reasons? Is it the Netflix or YouTube? So, what's the reason? Well, um, basically, we live in a world that is very complex. Yeah. And we have the same brain as uh, they had in ancient Greece or ancient Rome. The brain didn't change much in the last 2,000 years. But if we look around, our surroundings is, is very different. We live in a very complex world. And complexity is a source of this phenomenon. This is called decision paralysis. Yeah, maybe you're familiar, familiar with this because we experience this kind of paralysis in many aspects of our lives. If we do shopping, yeah, we are standing in front of 40, 50 kinds of ketchup and we are not happy that we are able to choose out of 40. We are often feeling a little bit, uh, we are a little bit anxious that we are unable to choose at all. And this, this problem is, is source of procrastination because we have so many options. We have so many choices and at the end, with that many choices, we are unable to choose one. So we are overwhelmed with emails, with priorities, with tasks in general. And we are experiencing this kind of paralysis even at workspace and even if we are choosing a life partner or life career and so on. So we are overwhelmed by complexity. And we all want to live a fulfilled life. Uh, this is very common if you are in Asia, in, if you are in the Europe, in, in, in the US. What is common is that we all want to live a fulfilled life, happy life, life full of purpose. But there is a hole of procrastination and the data is very scary. It seems that uh, young people between their 20 years and 30 years old, they spend almost 40 hours weekly with procrastination. So it is a lot of potential that is wasted there. And at the end, if we waste our potential and time there, we are not fulfilled and then we are not happy. So procrastination is one of reasons why depression rate is growing in Western world. Because we don't know what to do, we are lost. And this is quite common even in uh, big firms, big corporations in Manhattan. Like, they are working a lot, but they don't see purpose of what they are doing. So, lack of purpose is one of uh, another reasons that we are very depressed. So, but I have a good news. You can really decrease your procrastination. And today, I want to share with you some key findings, what science knows about it, and what we can do on a daily basis. So, what is the key? Yeah, that is, this is the very favorite question when I do interviews. A journalist, they usually ask me, like, if you summarize your book in one, quest, uh, one, 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 one simple sentence, how it should be? And it, this is the thing you don't want to hear if you spend many years with your book, to summarize it in one sentence. But uh, I found one, one uh, proverb from Japan that really describes 
uh, my whole work. And I love Japan. I go to Japan every year. I was there six times. I spent more than half a year in Japan. And I love Japanese culture. And you can find some very, very uh, useful like proverbs, like old uh, samurais uh, uh, quotes that are, can, uh, can, can be deployed even in uh, this day and age. And this is my the most favorite Japanese proverb. It follows like this. Vision without action is a daydream, and action without vision is a nightmare. And this simple quote really describes two main problems we usually have. The first problem is the first part of the proverb, vision without action. We often know what to do. Yeah, we set our New Year's resolutions. We know that we want to exercise more. We, want, we know that we want to start running and so on. But at the end, we are unable to start. We are stuck. So that's the vision without action. And it is really a daydream. But what is even worse is the second part of the proverb. Action without vision. We often do things, but we don't see any purpose of that. And if we lack a purpose, if we do activities without meaning, those activities can be a nightmare. And as I said, the, the, there is a lot of data and a lot of scientific research that lack of meaning is one of the main causes of uh, depression these days. Those are the, those folks in uh, big corporations that they are working on projects and they don't see any uh, positive outcome of that and they are simply disconnected. It seems that like 80 to 90% of people, they don't like jobs they, don't, they do. And it's a global phenomenon. It's not just in the US. So how to find a meaning in life? How to find life vision? Because basically we need both, yeah. We, we need a life vision. We need to know what to do in our private life. We need to know that we want to exercise more, eat healthy, and so on. Or in our career, what subjects we want to study, and so on. So we need to have a vision, because it's a, it's a main source of intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation is the best motivation in long term. There is a lot of data that extrinsic motivation doesn't work. Carrot and stick doesn't work. Because it's not from inside. So vision is a source of intrinsic motivation. And then if we have a strong vision, we need the second ingredient, and that is an action. We need to have a courage to step out of our comfort zone, to change our behavior, to start something new, or to move to the US, as Matthias did, <laughs> or as I did. And at the end, we are happy, because happiness is the outcome of living every day meaningfully and to the fullest. So this is the simple uh, formula of happiness that is evidence-based. And let me discuss those two topics. Let me discuss the topic of vision, how you can improve your life vision, and then let me discuss the topic of action, how to improve your willpower, how to improve your time management and priorities. So let's start with vision. Why vision is so important? Well, the first idea is that our time is the most valuable resource we all have. We often think that money is the most valuable resource, but it's not true. You cannot borrow your time, you cannot save it. Every wasted minute is wasted forever. So sometimes we need to think about the value of time. That time is the most valuable resource we all have. And procrastination is the greatest enemy of that, of living the life to the fullest. And sometimes we recognize that when it's too late. People, when they are in a situation that their life is in danger, then they recognize that the life and the time was very valuable. And there was a research made in uh, retirement houses and in hospitals, and uh, they, they questioned people just before they, they, uh, their, their death. And what was the outcome was that people in their 
lives do not regret what they did, but what they didn't. So at the end, we basically regret time that we procrastinated. We regret the decisions we never made, and so on. So if we don't want to regret at the end, we need to do wise decisions in the present moment. Basically, every day is separated. We, we wake up and we have a new day in front of us. And what we do during the day is in our hands. So think about that. Like, uh, think about every day is separated and try to live every day meaningfully and to the fullest. And if you do that, well, you will have a greater chance to be happy at the end of the day and you will have a bigger chance to really live the whole life to the fullest. And me personally, I had two stories in my life that I experienced something that is called near-death experience. First story is covered in my book and that was the beginning of my book. Uh, I was 18 years old and I was playing basketball and uh, I started to feel something very strange in my right hand and I thought that it's because of the ball. No, it wasn't. It was kind of brain paralysis and after a few hours, my right side of body was completely paralyzed. It was one of the strongest moments in my life because I was facing my own death. I thought that I'm not going to survive that. But luckily, I survived that. After a few days, everything went back to the normal without any side effects. But my life was changed forever because facing your own death can help you to recognize what is important and what is not important. So since then, I was trying to find the answer, what is purpose of my life? How can I live the, the life to the fullest? How can I live life without procrastination? So and that was the first story. The second story was very similar. And it was three years ago. I had a flight from Amsterdam to Prague. And after 15 minutes, uh, our right engine blew up. And uh, there was a blast of sparks at the right engine and then a regular fire, fire before the engine shut down. You don't want to experience that in, when you are in air. Uh, that was terrible. Well, we, we started from Amsterdam and after, after 15 minutes, somewhere on the uh, border with Germany, the engine blew up and we had to perform emergency landing. Emergency landing is a situation that you are waiting like this and you are waiting basically for the impact. And uh, it was another very strong moment, uh, one of those strongest moments in my life. And uh, the first question that I had in, in my head was, should I wear my jacket or not? Well, I put it off, and uh, then I had another 15 minutes to think. And at and, and the end, uh, it was very similar to the first, first situation. And in those situations, you, you really recognize what is important. Like, since then, I'm only focusing on meaningful activities. Doing things not for myself, but for, the, uh, for others. Doing some selfless things. Because what is important is to have a strong sense of purpose and meaning in life. And uh, since then, I'm focusing on having uh, deep relationships because that's what is, it is also very important. So basically, let me summarize those two stories. We, were, uh, we all were born in one moment and the destiny we all share is that life will end somewhere in the future. And the time we have here is both limited and finite. And that's the fact that is very important because that's why the procrastination is bad. Yeah, because if we live forever, we could procrastinate hundreds of years and it's not a problem, but because life is fi uh, fi finite, we have to ask ourselves what to do with our life, what to do with our time that we have here. And there is a lot of scientific data that if we know this answer, we are much more motivated we are able to overcome failure much easier. And we live longer, we are much more happy, and we have better relationship, and we, are, we have a successful career. If we know the purpose of our life. 
So it's, it is very important to ask yourself those kind of questions. And I want to help you to find your life purpose. Because there is a purpose in life, and a huge part, portion of that is purpose at work. And during your studies, it is very important to find what makes you happy, what are your strengths, how you can deploy your strengths in doing something meaningful, how you can improve society a bit, how to improve the world a bit and pass it to the next generation in a better state than uh, we get it. So, and there is a part of the brain that is activated when we do something for others. And there, there was a huge research on happiness and they asked people what were the strongest moments in their lives and basically what they described was something selfless. Those moments that they stopped next to accident and helped someone. Because key to happiness is not to being selfish, but being selfless. This part of the brain is activated when we do something for others, not for ourselves, but for others. And basically, th this key concept is a uh, center of Japanese concept of Ikigai from Japanese island of Okinawa. Japanese island of Okinawa is a very interesting place because uh, they have the longest average lifespan in the world. They live 10 years longer than we do in a Western world. 10 healthy years. So what is the secret in Okinawa? Why they live that long? Well, let me explain you. So this is the world. Is it correct? Perfect, thank you. And I have some scientific data. Yeah. This is US, this is Japan, and this is Okinawa. And this is coronary heart disease, this is colon cancer, this is prostatic cancer, this is breast cancer. Lymphoma. You see those differences? That's amazing, that's crazy. That's, this is quite, quite impossible. So, and they made a long-term research, about 10 years long. Why so? Why they are so healthy? Why they live their lives to their hundreds? And we know the answer. And the answer is Ikigai. So, where you can buy it? What is Ikigai? Well, in the main study, they call it a strong sense of purpose. And a strong sense of purpose the Ikigai was associated with a 72% lower rate of death from stroke, 44% lower rate of death from cardiovascular diseases, and 38% lower rate of death from any cause. Those are those cancers. So it seems that what affects our longevity the most is the concept of doing something greater than uh, just doing something selfish. And Ikigai is defined as a connection of four key areas. First area is find your strengths and try to deploy them on an everyday basis. So first area is what are you good at? So knowing your strengths is, is, is a key for having a successful career and it's a key of having a successful and happy life. The second part is what do you like to do? Someone likes playing squash, someone likes to play football, someone likes to play basketball. So knowing and being able to recognize what makes you happy is also very important. So it is like empathy, but to yourself. And the, last, uh, the, 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 third, the third part is what the world needs. So that's the part of the purpose. And the last, of course, what you can get paid for. So basically those four areas together forms the concept of Ikigai. And if you have an Ikigai in your life, then you are improving, you enjoy what you are doing, and you have more positive emotions. And in psychology, they call this state, state of flow. Flow is the moment when time stops for you and you are in a present moment enjoying what you are doing. Maybe you heard a famous saying that path is the destination. And that's the ikigai, like focusing on journey rather than goals makes you happy in a present moment and then you perform much better. You have more 
serotonin and dopamine in your brain, you are much more creative, and basically your brain works much better when you are in a state of flow. State of flow is just an exact opposite of procrastination. So more flow, the more flow you have, the less you procrastinate, and vice versa. So basically, what is the key to happiness? Many people, they think that it's like this. Yeah? First results, and then happiness. When you finish your school, then you are happy. When you buy that car, you are happy. When you buy a new iPhone, you are happy. No. There is a huge meta-analysis, the huge research. They took all the research, and they make a research on that. And it seems it's just the opposite. When you are happy in the present moment, if you are in a state of flow, if you have your ikigai, then you get much more results. And Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, one, one, one of the most famous psychologists, uh, he did a research on best sportsmen, best uh, entrepreneurs, best people in uh, different categories. And what he found was that more flow they had, more successful they were. So this key concept, focusing on a path rather than the destination, and finding ikigai is the key for finding procrastination. And it is beautifully summarized by a quote by Albert Schweitzer. Albert, Albert Schweitzer won a Nobel Prize in uh, 1952, uh, Peace uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize. And basically he described the same. He said that success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you love what you are doing, you will be successful. So I think that this is the core of my work in my book. Find your ikigai, find your strengths, ask what the world needs, try to do things for your community, try to think of others rather than yourself, and at the end, enjoy the road, enjoy the path. And if you enjoy the path, you are much more in the state of flow, and you procrastinate less. So this is one key ingredient of finding procrastination. So that was the first chapter. Basically, the first idea was finding life vision. It was about recognizing the value of our time. It was about intrinsic motivation. It was about purpose. It was about ikigai. And it was about path rather than a destination. So always remember that happiness is an outcome of meaningful activities. And meaningful, meaningful activities means that we are focusing on something higher than we are, something bigger than we are, and trying to change the world a bit is the key of happiness, in, of long-term happiness. And the second chapter is about action, how to force ourselves to really do something. So this is the really uh, part about willpower, about what science uh, sometimes calls self-regulation, how to really push ourselves. And to understand why we are so bad in, uh, will, with this uh, topic is that we ha have to understand our brains. Yeah. The brain is a very useful tool, right? But it was, it, it's sometimes uh, it was evolved in a very different environment than uh, in, we, in, in different than uh, the environment is now. So to understand the brain, it is very important to understand the ability of brain that is called neuroplasticity. Basically, neuroplasticity means that the brain can be trained in the long term. So now we have a research on identical twins. And it seems that if those twins were raised in a different families, one kid can be a great procrastinator, and the second can be very good and can be uh, very productive. So it seems that only like 15, 20, 25 percent are inborn, but uh, we can influence a lot during our life. So how to train willpower? Well, our willpower, it works like muscle. You can train willpower in the long term. So this is unstimulated brain, this is stimulated brain. You, you see that there are much more connections. So if you do 20 push-ups daily, 
not just your muscles are growing in the long term, but even the part of the brain that is called prefrontal cortex that is uh, evolved for willpower. So you can really improve your willpower in the long term. And this is a really good news because you can really decrease your procrastination up to, I don't know, 70, 80, maybe 90% if you train your brain. And how to train your brain? Well, let me explain you. The human brain can be divided into three main sections. The oldest one is reptilian brain. That is the part of the brain uh, that is all about instincts. You cannot control this part of the brain. You cannot commit suicide by stopping breathing. You cannot do that. You can try it after the presentation and you will see that it doesn't work. If it works, I can give you one book. Yeah. Then, many million, uh, millions of years ago, another part of the brain was evolved and it was a limbic brain, the first mammals. And this brain is all about emotions. And a few thousand years ago, so it's a very short period of time of, of, uh, of the history of life on plan, planet Earth, the neocortex was evolved. And this part of the brain is about rational thinking. This is the part of the brain that is capable of language. And this is the part of the brain that uh, is the main difference between us and other creatures. And what is very important is this part of the brain that is called the prefrontal cortex, the part that willpower is. And if you cut the brain in the middle, what you see is that you have much more connections from the emotional brain to the rational than backwards. So basically, our decisions are much more influenced by emotions than by rational thinking. Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize in economy because of his research in this field. And what he found was that we are not rational that much as classical economic uh, expected. So basically, we do our decisions based on our emotions, and then we only use the rational brain to rationalize our decisions. So first emotions, and then just to confirm the, the decision, we use our logic. So I, I have a favorite example, and that's my new iPhone. It was not a rational decision, because it's quite the same as the previous one. But somehow, I, I bought it. Why? Because of my emotions. So basically we do decisions based on our emotions more than on our logic. And at the end, if you understand this uh, structure of the brain, then you understand why people vote differently, why they behave differently, why they procrastinate so much. Because the red brain, the emotional brain, is the one that wants to order another beer, that want to overeat, that doesn't want to exercise. Because the red brain, the emotional brain, is focusing on the present moment. The blue brain, the rational brain, is focusing on the future. But it's much, much uh, less strong because it's much younger. And I have amazing uh, allegory of elephant and rider. You can imagine that you have a huge elephant and you have a rider that is trying to tame the elephant, is trying to push the elephant to go forward. And as the, uh, the, the rider should know some tricks, some tools how to push the elephant forward, all of us can be divided into two separate creatures. The elephant is symbol of the limbic system. This elephant is symbol of our emotions. Elephant want uh, pleasure now. And then we have the neocortex, the younger part of the brain that is symbolized by the rider. That is much more smarter, but it's much smaller. So to un understand that we all of us are combination of emotions and rational thinking, elephants and riders, 
can really help you to understand why we procrastinate so much. You don't procrastinate, your elephants do. So it's all about elephants. And there is only one group of people that don't procrastinate. Try to guess who? Psychopaths. Because psychopaths, they have a leisure of amygdala. They have uh, no elephants. So for them, it's easy to push themselves without elephants because they are just rational. But there is only 1% of psychopaths in a, glo in a society, so only a few of you. The rest of us, we have elephants. So to understand how to, how to tame our elephants is the key. It's the key not just to fight procrastination, but it's the key of uh, what is called self-regulation. There is a huge meta-analysis about procrastination, maybe the biggest research on procrastination ever. And it seems that lack, lack of self-regulation is the reason why we procrastinate so much. So we are unable to tame our elephants. So how we, how we can uh, do that more effectively? Well, we need willpower. You can imagine willpower as a glass of water. And whenever you use your willpower, the water drains away. And when we are tired, the rider is unable to ride the elephant and we do basically better decisions. We are much more on social media, we procrastinate even more, we do our bad habits and so on. So one key ideas of fighting procrastination is to have regular rest. So when you study one hour or when you work one hour and then you walk for five minute walk, science shows us that then, then your willpower can restart, is, is restarted. So key for productivity is really to have regular rest. Another idea based in, on, on science is that willpower is based on simple sugars from vegetables or from fruits. So the best way how to be really productive is to work or study one hour, then to have a glass of fresh juice, then study another hour, then have a, another walk for five minutes around the block of buildings, and so on. So it is important to have a rest regularly and go for a walk before you are tired, because when you are tired, then you are unable to push yourself to fight procrastination. So you procrastinate fighting procrastination. And that's the problem. So more you procrastinate, more you procrastinate. So those simple five-minute walks and uh, more fruits and vegetables during the day is the key of strong willpower. And there is another idea, and that is uh, mindfulness. You are probably fam familiar with that. There is a great app that is called Headspace. It's for 10 minutes daily, and the first um, course is for free. And definitely you should try that because it's only 10 minutes daily, but it can boost your productivity too. So it, it's, it's about like uh, being calm and being in present moment. And there is a lot of data that can, uh, this mindfulness technique can really improve your willpower in the long term too. So basically, you can restore, restart your willpower during the day. And that's the key of productivity. So don't try to uh, do big things. Try to do small things, but regularly. And that's the key of training willpower. Because you can, you can improve, strengthen your willpower in the long term. So how we can boost our willpower? There is a lot, a lot of uh, data that if we find our personal vision, not just the rider, but the elephant should follow the vision. But sometimes we know that we need to do something, but our elephant doesn't want. For example, I know I have in my life personal vision that I want to be successful, but I have to call someone. Or I want to be healthy, but I have to go running, and there is that small cloud, and uh, there is a chance that it will r rain, so I postpone that and so on. So always on the way to success, there are those moments when you have negative emotion, you have paralysis, because you know that you have to do something, but your elephant doesn't want. 
And now I tell you what is, what is the secret, how you can overcome this. Always remember, don't threaten your elephant. This is the key. Because if you want to go running and you tell yourself to run five miles, well, then you threaten your elephant and you never start running. But if you tell yourself to run 500 feet, or if you tell yourself to wear some sportswear and go outside and then go inside, there's always some, a smaller step. Then the chance that you will be successful is much higher. So always remember, start with lower bar. Science causes micro habits. Maybe you heard the quote, less is more. So always try to start with some small, small steps and then try to repeat the small steps. So repetition makes uh, us like, uh, good with habits. So uh, the key of building willpower is to really start with small steps and then to repeat it and then you build a new habit. And after you have a new habit, you can raise the bar again. And that's the way how you can train to marathon. Start with small steps, but then repeat them. So you can start five minutes on treadmill, and after you do it like five times, ten times, you can increase the amount. And I think that now you understand the key. And that's another Japanese word, and this is ikigai. Oh, no, kaizen, sorry. This one is kaizen. The first was ikigai, the second is kaizen. And that's the way how all Japanese uh, samurais train themselves. Kaizen is about small steps and about small acts of courage on a daily basis. So if you overcome yourself on a daily basis, then you improve your willpower in the long term. So, and I have a special tool for that. The first tool was Ikigai, and the second tool is Habit List. And it's a very simple tool uh, that can help you to boost your willpower. This is a habit list of one of my clients. Basically, it's a simple table that you use um, for each month, and those are days, and those are habits. So, for example, you, uh, the first habit that is very useful is filling the habit list. So you get the first green dot just for filling in the habit list. The second habit can be waking up with the first alarm clock or waking up before, I don't know, 7.30. Then to have, for example, exercise, like running. Or then you can have some bad habit you, you, you want to fight with, like alcohol, cigarettes, caffeine, whatever you want. And the last column is very important. It's uh, you'll try to rate on a scale 1 to 10 how fulfilled was that day. So 10 is the maximum one is completely uh, lost today, five somewhere in the middle. And then the limits. Fill in the habit list uh, daily, uh, wake up before 7.30, run 500 feet, drink two glasses of wine, minimal, no, maximum, and then write the potential. And this is a real case of one of my clients. So the, f the first day he woke up early, he ran, he didn't drink at all, alcohol. The next day, he also woke up early, ran, and drank nothing. But then, third day, he had four glasses of wine. And the next day, he didn't wake up early. No running. And the potential was only on, on five, on a scale of one to ten. And the, the other day, it was fine again. And so on. I guess that you get the main idea. Uh, it's a visual feedback of, of those habits. If you pass them, you get a green. If you don't, you get red. And it's very simple, but a very useful tool. I recommend you to do it, um, and this tool can really improve your willpower. Because if you do it regularly, and if you uh, set the limit, the bar, that doesn't threaten your elephant, then uh, you will be successful, and it, it will train your willpower in the long term. So this is the second key tool from my book. The first was uh, Ikigai, or Finding Life Vision, and the second is a, a habit list. For me, the habit list is really the core, 
because it can change you in the long term. You cannot change yourself from one day to another, but you can change yourself when you change your habits. And this tool is very simple, but very useful for that. And let me share with you the last practical tool. And it is called Everyday Heroism. This tool is about the ability to act in the right moment. And for me, this tool is maybe the most important from all of those tools. Because you don't need a special paper for that. It's about your mindset. Yeah, it's about the mindset of being a little hero. Because it's about the fact that sometimes we need to act. Sometimes we need to speak up when the others are silent. Sometimes we need to stop next to, next to an accident and help someone. And sometimes it's about to have a courage to say no. It's sometimes to have a courage to follow your life values. And let me discuss this tool because I think that the world needs this tool the most. Why so? I learned this tool from Professor Zimbardo. Zimbardo is a famous psychologist from Stanford University, and uh, he did the famous Stanford Prison Experiment. It is still slightly controversial, but uh, what Zimbardo did was that he took a bunch of normal average people and he divided them into two groups. And the first group was arrested and was brought into a uh, cellar of Stanford University that was a uh, prison. And in that prison, they were waiting for them, uh, the second group of people, that they were average guys in the beginning, but they were put in a role of prison guards. And what happened, you probably know, that after a few days they had to stop the experiment because the average people in a role of uh, prison guards started to do very nasty things to uh, the prisoners, and it was very sad what happened. And Zimbardo then uh, started to do a lot of research on why and what makes people evil. Why sometimes average people turn into evil. Then he started to research the opposite part. He started to research why sometimes someone turns into hero. Why someone is able to stop next to an accident when the others are just uh, follow the crowd and don't stop. And I want to explain you what is the core of heroism. This is a very key idea from psychology and I think that you can deploy it even for fighting procrastination. When I met Zimbardo for the first time, I met him three times in my life, and when I met him for the first time, I really love one of his quotes. In his book, Time Paradox, he writes, the core of your life can be reduced to two types of actions, those taken and those not taken. And really, this is the core. Yeah, sometimes you have to get up or you stay in the bed. Sometimes you have to tell your opinion or you, you stay silent. So really, the core of our life is about things that we take or don't take. So, and I asked Zimbardo, what is his secret of fighting procrastination? And he did something very strange. He took my black marker and he put the black dot on his forehead. And I was like, what? He's a psychologist, well, he's a little bit old now. No, he explained to me something that, is, that was so important, maybe one of the key ideas I ever heard. So what was that? He told me that when you have a black dot on your forehead and you go shopping, you go by bus somewhere, you get used to that you are different. And then you are able to step out of your social comfort zone. And Zimbardo described to me that we have basically two types of comfort zones. First is physical one. That is the uh, bed in the morning. Uh, it, it's, it's very convenient in there. But then we have a social comfort zone, that we are part of the crowd. And around the comfort zone, there, there is a discomfort zone. That's the moment when we act and we, we do something. And basically what Zimbardo described was that 
the ability to step outside of our comfort zone is the core of heroism. And the heroes that did the big heroistic acts were able to do even the small acts before. So heroism is not a thing that is inborn, but it can be trained. The more you overcome yourself, the higher is the chance that you will overcome yourself in the future. And what is very important is that also our happiness lies outside of our comfort zone. Many people, they think that happiness is in the comfort zone, but it's not the truth. We need to overcome ourselves, and then we experience happiness. Because our happiness is outside of our comfort zone. I guess that the best moments in your life were outside of your comfort zones. And basically, this is very nicely described by Gandhi's quote. Overcoming fear is the first step to success. Of course, in the beginning, you need to step out and do something new. You have to uh, have a courage to change things, to start new hobbies, to start new, new sports, and so on. But this is the key of, of finding procrastination too, to have a courage. Because to, uh, to wake up with first alarm clock, it's also little heroism. Uh, to go running when there is a rain, it's also little heroism. So the heroism is a key concept for me. And what is very important, sometimes to the, be the first one who acts. I have a very sad story from the city when I was born. It's quite a small city, three times bigger than Aberdeen. <laughs> and <clears throat> there was this case that uh, one old guy, he died in a railway station. He was eating something and he started to choke and uh, he was dying there 10 minutes. And from CCTVs, uh, we can see that there were a lot of people around him and no one called the ambulance. There were two girls eating there, literally watching him dying and they did, did nothing. Do you think that those people were evil? Probably not. They were not just heroes. They were unable to act. And that's very sad because uh, what I feel is that sometimes we need to act. We have to have a courage to do something. Because as uh, you can see in this picture, sometimes it's very important to not to follow the crowd. This is from Germany. And sometimes it is very important to be this guy. To not to just have values, but to act according to those values. And I had a big talk in Moscow two years ago in front of 350 uh, Russian entrepreneurs. And it was very important because it was in a University of Skolkovo that is like Russian Harvard. And one week before me, there was Putin having talk. So I have a picture that Putin, me, both are hanging on a wall. And... Um, and for me, it was maybe one of the strongest moments in my life that I was able to influence someone. And my talk ended with this quote from Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I deeply believe in this uh, sentence. And I feel that we as a global citizens, we have some struggles these days and we need to have a courage to fight those struggles. And uh, for me, it, the, the talk in Russia re reminded me that uh, now the world is connected. And I think that we have to overcome two main problems. The first problem is called Dunning-Kruger effect. Basically, the last chapter of my book is about Dunning-Kruger effect. What is that? Well, you have two axes. You have an axis of knowledge and then you have access of confidence. And basically it should be like that. The more knowledge you have, more confident you are. But it's not the case. It's like this. Yeah, people, if they read one article about vaccination, then they are 100% sure that they understand vaccinations. So basically those people, this is the Dunning-Kruger effect, less people know, more certain they are about themselves. So basically, the ignorance is a sign of confidence or vice versa. Confident people are often ignorant people. Because more knowledge you have, more humble you are. 
I call this volley of humbleness. And then experts get confidence again, but never reach the level of those people. They call those people incompetent in that study. And I think that those people are maybe the most dangerous people because uh, they are 100% sure about their opinions and uh, they are comment on social media the most and so on. So this is called Dunning-Kruger effect. And I think that the cure of Dunning-Kruger effect is humbleness. My two near-death experience made me a little bit more humble. And I think that this is the core of, uh, of the good future of, of life on the planet Earth, to be more hum humble, to be there rather than there. So when someone is 100% sure, it often means that he doesn't understand the world because the world is a complex system and uh, we need to be humble and we need to ask questions and so on. So that's the first uh, key uh, problem and we need a kind of uh, heroism to fight it. And the second is in-group bias. What is in-group bias is the division between us and them. And we have scientific data that if we are divided to us and them, then we don't feel empathy with others from the, the, the second group. So, and this is very dangerous. Uh, we only feel empathy with the one from our tribe, but we don't feel empathy with the ones from another tribe. So at the end, this is the outcome. This is the case that before Brexit, uh, one politician was killed in, in, in UK because of different opinions. And this is really sad because she has two kids. And uh, for me, that, that was one of the saddest moments uh, because now, now we have those stories from Syria. We have those stories from around the globe. And all of this is this, this study because people, they don't feel empathy with the, the, the others from, uh, from another tribe. What is the solution? It's not to divide people between us and them, and only be us, be global citizens. Because um, in, in one scientific research, they call it uh, circles of, of empathy. Like in a history, you had a circle of empathy with uh, your family, then with your nation. But now we can have a, a much wider circle of empathy and uh, be global citizens and uh, respect the others. And I think that we need to find some universal values that can unite people. I sometimes call this religion 2.0, to find some values that are uh, universal, that can unite all of us, even people from Asia, from Europe, from, from the US, from Africa. And I have some ideas how those values can look like. This guy, Václav Havel, he's, he was uh, our former, he's our former president, and he, when he had a talk in a U.S. Congress, he, he got a long-standing ovation from both Democrats and Republicans. And I want to share some of his story. He said that truth and love must prevail over lies and hatred. And he was a very humble man. He was arrested during the communist period, and then he became our president. He was like a uh, like very, uh, very big leader, not just for uh, our nation, but for all communistic uh, nations. So I think that those two values are very important these days. What is truth? For me, truth is critical thinking. It's rationality, to ask about sources, to fight fake news, and being humble, to always admit that you can be wrong or be able to uh, ask questions. So that's the part of truth. And then we need love, we need empathy, we need kindness, we need tolerance. So I think that those two values are the core of, of the future, better global society. So that's the key of my work too. I wrote a book about procrastination, but it its core, it's all about values and it's all about how to improve our lives and how to uh, improve the world a bit. So that's the basically 
uh, the core of leadership. I do a lot of leadership trainings in Europe. Uh, I have clients like Microsoft, Google, all those big companies. And if I have a leaders, I always tell them that core of leadership is to have values and to have a courage to act according to them. Because if you change yourself, you can inspire people around you. So you can change groups, you can change your family, you can change uh, your colleagues uh, at work, you can change your uh, friends in, in your uh, university, and then that's the way how to change the whole society. So it all starts with values and with leadership. So the procrastination is just the exact opposite of that. So I really believe in a bright future, but someone has to do that. And who? So who wants to live in a better world? Tell me. And who is able to do that? Yeah, now you get it. We have to do that. Because the problem is the bystander effect. Everyone thinks, oh, someone will do it. No, we have to do that. We have to do that. So, because the world is interconnected. So let me summarize the whole talk. We started with uh, those two ingredients. I started with the importance of having life purpose, appreciate the value of our time, and to try to find ikigai, life vision. Then we discuss the part of the action. It was about elephant and rider, it was about willpower, it was about habits, micro habits, the small steps, it was about the Japanese concept of uh, Kaizen, and uh, we have two tools for the second part. So for the first part, we had a Ikigai, and the for, for the second part, from the action part, we had a habit list, that simple table that you can fill in daily and you can boost your willpower, and we have everyday heroism. And I think that the heroism is the key part of finding procrastination, to have courage to act. So overall, I have this picture in my presentation, I don't know, now for seven, eight years. And this year, I made a decision that I should find this place. Yeah, and I, I did. And it was one of the strongest moments in my life because the next day I climbed Mount Fuji and it took me like nine hours and a half. And I had a vision that I want to climb the Fuji and then I had an action, I did it, and then I experienced the positive emotions. So I really believe that this formula works in the long term in, on, on a daily basis. Like to have a vision and to have the courage to follow the vision. Basically, we need passion and persistence. Passion to do something that we believe is important and persistent not to give up. So, and I want to ask you a few questions. Now, think about one important idea. So, what was the key message for you? If you will think in the future about the fact that we met in 2019, what is the key message that you want to remember from today? And please note it down. It is very important to note it down because brain often forgets things. So please, now we have like two, three minutes to note down the main message for you. And then I will ask a few of you what was the main message for you. So please note down what was the key message out of my talk for you. And then we have a discussion because that's a very important part of my work too. So now, now a few of you have a chance to train heroism. So tell me what was the main message for you? Thank you. So what was, what was it? Actually, just what you said, that heroism can be found in small actions Right. Um, usually, I believe that heroism was doing these huge, ginormous things, and no, it's actually found in small actions. And these small actions, if you combine them, yeah. then you get rid of procrastination. That's awesome. And I have one more idea about heroism. And uh, all Japanese samurais they had a free heartbeat rule that if you are in a situation that you can do an heroic act, you have to act in three heartbeats. Basically, three, two, one, and then act. Because if you wait 
longer, your brain come up with excuses why not to do that. So basically, maybe uh, you will be in the situation that you can save someone, someone's life. Remember this, three, two, one, and tell yourself heroes, they act and do something. Thank you. So another main idea, yes. So I wrote down that life is finite and our time is our mo most valuable resource and we need to find better ways to use this time. So that Thank way you we so like much. Live each day to the most potential it has. Thank you so much. It is so important that you don't need to experience the near-death experience to recognize this is the very important idea. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I wrote elephant is emotion and I'm writing elephant. So I need to control elephant, but don't threaten the elephant and don't procrastinate. Amazing, yeah. amazing. <laughs> so we all have elephants, so be nice to them. Don't threaten them, but try to uh, improve yourself with those small steps. And then you can really train your elephants and at the end you can be much happier. So. But remember, not just you uh, have elephants, but others also, so, so like your partners, they have your, uh, also their elephants. And that's why we often act irrationally because our decisions are based in emotions and emotions are often very irrational. So remember that, thank you. Um, I wrote truth and love are universal values that can unify all global citizens. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That, that, that was, uh, you know, I add this uh, slide today. So it was unique for you because I feel that we really need to think about those bigger issues these days, like with the war in Syria and with other uh, examples that what is happening in the, in, in the global uh, world. So thank you so much that you mentioned that because it was very important to me to explain you those two values. Thank you so much. So another two free uh, ideas. Oh, is there I someone? Don't see any hand. Yeah. So please wait, wait for Mike. It's okay. <laughs> no, it is me. Um, one thing is, it is in my hands. Yep. And it's always good to know that these fears that you think are strictly within yourself are, are universal. Right. And I really enjoyed the part about our, the decision paralysis, you know, the bottles of ketchup and just our world right. is so full of choices that you, you do have to make a decision and it's in your hands. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really think that the future is in our hands and remember it every day is unique and uh, what you do is in, in, in your hands so, uh, and it gives you a brighter future because you can really change every day. You can improve yourself every day and after two, three weeks, two, three months, you will be better. So always remember it's on daily basis and uh, every day is in your hands. Thank you so much. So last two ideas. So I wrote down the Japanese word ikigai consists of like four things, like what you're good at, what you can get paid for, like you know, some other like two stuffs. Uh -huh. So that if you're not really sure what you're going for right now, could be your ikigai or something, you just think about these four components. Right, yeah, and I think that it's like forever. I, I feel that I found my ikigai, but still you can improve all those four parts uh, in a long term, so it's like long term process. It's more journey than the destination. So finding ikigai is even good when you are retired. Uh, I set up an NGO two, three years ago, and what we do are the free trainings in retirement houses. And we try to inspire uh, like the old generation to do something. And we have a case of a guy that he's 75 years old, and he started, uh, st he basically started his own, own new business. So he, he has a startup now. 
75 years old. Another case is an uh, 80 years old guy that uh, ran his first marathon. And what I've, I'm really inspired by those stories, but we don't need to wait to our 80s to start something. So we can do it now. That, that, that's the good news. So thank you so much for Ikigai concept. And uh, I was in Okinawa. It's a beautiful part of Japan. So I uh, recommend you to go to Okinawa to find your Ikigai there. No, you can find it here. <laughs> and the last uh, message. Anyone? If no one takes one, I can share yeah, one. You, you can share <laughs> Since your I one. have the mic on me. So <laughs> for me, right now, it was a truth and love. Because I'm kind of sure when I'm kind of truth, even like in a way of myself, and I'm kind of I'm self-reflective and being really truthful about myself. This is what it is. And I'm not making excuses that I can make a progress. And when I am feel full of love, which for me can be empathy, can be a kindness, I can really feel a good feeling. I can start with small things. I can help people just find things. I can help find a way. I can do small things every day. And then it can improve my feelings and it can improve my overall life. So yeah. these values are really helpful for me and meaningful. Thank yeah. you. And I, I met a lot of very kind people these two days, basically. I. Uh, arrived in Aber to Aberdeen uh, yesterday, and I met a lot of very nice people. And you are very lucky that you can study here in this university. I think it's quite unique. I never experienced that uh, high level of love, empathy, kindness. Uh, so thank you so much that you invited me. And uh, now we have time for questions. So if you have any question, now it's the right time. You can, and Matej will give you a mic. So it means that everything was clear to you, <laughs> right? Hi. Um, since you talk about the book, you make a lot of language version. Do uh -huh. you guys make a Somali version or Arabic? Not yet, but if you can help me somehow with that, <laughs> I'm really open to have more languages. Yeah, because I think that those ideas are really international. I, 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 I'm getting emails every day around the globe. Yeah, f from Australia, f from Russia, from Japan, from the US. And those emails are quite the same. Yeah, we have the same struggles because we have same Netflix, we have same Instagram. We, we are having the same problems. Uh, there is a division in the, in the societies all around the world, like with Brexit in, in the UK and so on. So I feel that we are not that different. Yeah, you maybe notice that we are quite the same. We all have our elephants. We all have the similar struggles. We have uh, the decision paralysis and so on and so on. So what I believe is that we maybe live in the world that can be united uh, maybe because of uh, technologies, because of social media. And it's not happening, so we should do something for that. And my work, my, my book is uh, my mission. It's all about to spread those, those values globally. So if you have a chance to translate it into, into Somali or, or Arabic, I would love to have Arabic version too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, do you have any strategies or maybe any resources that you Yes, yeah, social media detox. Wow, that's a cool question because uh, there is a, a research about Instagram, and it seems that more you use Instagram, the higher uh, you uh, have the risk of anxieties and depression because you are always comparing yourself with others, and you can always find someone that has more followers. I have a friend that he has uh, half a million of followers. And he's comparing himself with those that, he, that ha they have uh, 10 million and so on. So you always find someone who has more, who uh, has uh, b better vacations and so on. So the key of uh, finding this kind of addiction is not to compare yourself. Yeah, it's uh, one of the key of happiness is not to compare and be unique. Have your unique style, have your unique uh, life vision, and then you can be happy and you can be less addicted to social media because you are not comparing yourself. 
So, and another idea is uh, when I'm, I'm going to Japan every year for one month, and what I do is I uninstall my Facebook the first day I, uh, after arrival. And sometimes it's very important to have a detox, to have a few days without social media, and then uh, you recognize that there's a lot of happening around you. You can talk to people more, and we discussed that uh, with Erin yesterday, that sometimes it's about not to uh, switch on your cell phone and have it in your pocket and try to uh, talk to more people. So it's, it's, it's also heroism to not to use your cell phone and to try to talk to people, like the old way. <laughs> thank you so much for your question. Another question, thank you. So you say that life is finite and we have to make sure we use it productively. So then what can you put in place to, in, to prevent yourself from going too far the other way and trying to do too much now right. and essentially becoming stressed in that manner? Right, yeah. I, I think that uh, what is very important is a concept of self-forgiveness, not to push yourself that much and sometimes have a rest. Yeah, so sometimes there is a huge difference between procrastination and having a rest. So sometimes you need to have a proper rest and not to regret that. So I think that the key of uh, what I'm teaching is not to be workaholist, it's to be balanced, to have your private life, to have uh, your, your like uh, st st studies life or business life. And then you, have, you should have time for yourself. It's also very important. And it's about to have a courage to say no. For example, last week I had an offer from a television to have my own, uh, to have my own uh, series there. And it was quite, quite interesting, but I had to say no because it's not in my priority list because it was their priority to have a new uh, series. So sometimes it's about courage to say no and to, uh, I, I have one concept from my life. I was playing in punk band when I was in high school. So, and I always wished to myself to be a systematic punk. Systematic to have things in order, but be punk for me means to have courage to live outside of the box, to be able to improvise. So it means that I have some tools that I use, but I have sometimes courage to not to follow my my tools and to do crazy things. So being somewhere in the middle between punk, being creative, and be systematic is, is for me one of uh, the key answers for many, many questions. Thank you so much for the question. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, the last one. So please wait for Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I travel a lot. <laughs> yeah, I think that more you travel, more open-minded you are. And I visited, let's say, like 30, 30 countries probably. And what I feel is that we are all global citizens. Like, I have friends in many nations, many countries, uh, different religions. And uh, I started when I was 16 years old. I visited first exchange program in Germany. And we are a group of 15 people for, from 15 different countries. And there were like eight different religions in that group. And what we found was that we are all the same. We had all the same struggles. So for me, sometimes to travel is uh, the key for humbleness. It's a very humbling experience to be one week in a Muslim country, another one, uh, another week in Japan, another week in, in the US, and see that we are quite the same. Yeah, we are all global citizens, and we have the same struggles. So I really think that people should travel more. Because when you travel, it, it, yeah, humbling experience is the best definition. Thank you so much. Yeah, one, one more question, OK. Habit list was impressive, thank you. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a 
that's a very important question. What do you do when you have a lot of red dots? Basically, there are two causes of that. First is that you put a, a, a habit that is not aligned with your life vision. For example, if I push myself to play piano, and playing piano is not in my uh, personal vision, it would be red because I don't want to do that. So always ask yourself, do you really want to do that habit? Is it in your vision? And if it's in your vision, you could do a second mistake and you uh, had the uh, bar um, too, too, too high. So you can always decrease the amount. So if, for example, when I was uh, writing the book, in the beginning, I told myself, you should write a chapter. And it was so huge that I was procrastinating that. So procrastinating, writing book about procrastination was twice painful. <laughs> then I thought that I should write two paragraphs daily. So I lowered the bar, I put it in my habit list to write two paragraphs, and then I ended the book. So always remember that, the, that less is more, and if it's too, too red, you always can uh, decrease the amount and you can lower the bar again and again. And uh, so in the beginning, it should be like 80% green, and then uh, you can increase it. So always start with uh, small steps, and remember that micro habits is about uh, the quote, less is more. Thank you so much. So le let me uh, share last uh, ideas with you. You can follow me on social media, <laughs> on Instagram, of course. I need some more followers, no. <coughs> And I'm trying to fight procrastination on social media. It is very important these days. And you can find me at P-E-T-R Ludwig, or you can follow in procrastination. If you want to download this presentation, you can find it on my uh, Instagram account. So I put it like before it started. So now you can download it. It's for free there. So you can download the whole presentation on my Instagram or I will send it to you through, through Erin, probably. And I will send you the template of the habit list and uh, some other resources. If you want the book, uh, it's on Amazon. And now there is a special discount, like because we have a back to school campaign. So the discount is huge. It's like, I don't know, 60, 70% off. And the last thing is that uh, I started my uh, new podcast. I have my podcast in my country. It's in top three podcasts there. But uh, I wanted to do a podcast in English. So I have a new podcast. It is called Deep Talks in English. And I have amazing talk with Ola, Ola Rosling, that is a co-author of the book Factfulness. It is a very, very important book about critical thinking. I recommend you to uh, listen to our discussion and then read his book. Another amazing discussion with Eric Fang, that is a best-selling author in Asia. He's from Singapore, and we were discussing uh, the global citizenship and importance of having the communal va values. Or uh, Felix Seltner, that is from Germany, and he's organizing the big conference in New York about future of work. And Spencer Greenberg, he's uh, my good friend, and he's also uh, in a critical thinking. He, he's, he has a a PhD in applied math, and he has like five startups that are helping people with their rationality. So basically, this is all, yeah? And I wish you one thing. Now you have a knowledge, and now the knowledge is in your hands. So now it is very important what you do tomorrow, if you follow those ideas or not. So I wish you, I wish you to have a courage to change something. I wish you to be little heroes in your life. And at the end, I wish you to have a better life without procrastination. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.